Say at the Scriptures, a production of the Bethel Baptist Church right here in Prospect, Connecticut. We are a King James Bible-believing church, and we invite you to have your Bible handy. We ask you also to have a piece of paper and writing utensil so that you can jot down the different references that we use in these messages because they're Bible-based and I like your opinion whether you uh, agree with them or not. And so with that in mind, as we go through the message, uh, be sharp to hear the different references to the Bible passages and write those down. We're going to begin with uh, Psalm 37, verse number 4. It says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. Now, Lord, the, you gave the word, and we want to publish it, and so we ask your spirit to uh, guide us and direct our thoughts that we might produce uh, a good message today, and that people will be drawn to your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, give grace and abundance, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this is a very simple formula that God has given for everyone who loves the Lord. It says, delight thyself in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Now, what is it that you desire? People desire all sorts of things. Uh, every desire has a motive behind it. And, uh, you know, perhaps you want a better marriage or perhaps you want a better job. Maybe you want to just uh, be able to have a better standard of living. Maybe you want wisdom. Maybe you need to understand what the scriptures have to say. And uh, your, your desire is that you might be helped in this way. Well, James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8 say this. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So there you have a portion of scriptures telling you that if you desire wisdom, God will give it to you in quite liberally. But ask in faith, no doubting, no wavering, no questioning. Just trust him to give it to you, and he'll give it to you. But you have to be sure to understand that if you have a double mind about it, the Lord doesn't have to give you a thing as far as that wisdom is concerned. Now, here's a principle that you need to understand. You'll find it in James chapter 4, verse number 3, where James says, Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss. He says that ye may consume it upon your lusts. And there's a reason. Is that oftentimes the things we desire are just some lust, some fleshly or sensual lust that we want to fulfill, like, oh Lord, let me win the lottery, or oh Lord, uh, I'd like a brand new car, or, and uh, have someone give it to me. You know, some very silly things, silly mindedness. And because of that, that foolish asking, you want to consume it upon your own lust, it's for you, it doesn't want to glorify God, and so you ask amiss and you don't get what you receive. So oftentimes the, uh, the story is, well, I, I've been praying for this for a long time and God never gave it to me. I don't believe in prayer anymore. Well, the fact of the matter is there are some principles and this is one of them. You, have, you ask amiss and you don't get it because you're going to use it wrong and it's not going to glorify the Lord. Now, drawing your attention to the Old Testament, uh, books, the books that were given for our example as believers, Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. Find this out about the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. So here's a clue for you to get the desires of your heart. The psalmist says in 37.4, Delight thyself also in the Lord. Well, how do we delight ourselves in the Lord? Well, we delight ourselves in the Lord when we delight ourselves in the things that the Lord delights in. And three basic things things are 
loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness. In these things I delight, saith the Lord. Now the scriptures tell us the things that the Lord hates. And so it spells them out quite plainly. But here we have the things that delight the Lord. And basically to tell you this, that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Pleasing is a, is a word that almost matches the word delight. And so if we're going to please God, we have to have faith. This is why James says we must ask in faith nothing wavering, the no doubt position. Now these verses in Jeremiah tell us that God exercises love and kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth, amongst us, all around us. Happens all the time. It's man who messes the whole ordeal up. It says that he delights in them and he loves to see them in action and that it brings him great pleasure and much satisfaction. The Bible also says that God will give us the godly desires. Not just the flesh, not the fleshly desires, not the sensual desires, those lustful desires, but the godly desires. So that tells us we need to know what pleases God. And so, if we delight ourselves in the Lord, He's going to give us those desires, the godly desires of our heart. We understand how to make our earthly fathers pleased with us so we can obtain the things that we want from them. And uh, there's, if we're so busy about pleasing our earthly fathers, well, they're not going to have any problem giving us the things that we ask them for, as long as they're not going to hurt us. A wise child will always try to please his father. The Lord Jesus always did those things that pleased his Father. So it would be a wise thing to understand how to please our Heavenly Father, who gives his children richly all things to enjoy. So these are some basic clues. The delight comes in the doing. Listen, it's not enough just to delight in yourself in them, but to do the things that delight the Lord. Psalm 40, verse 8. Write this one down. Psalm 40, verse 8. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. So the law, the word of God, is in his heart. He's meditating on this word, so he's discovering what it is that delights the Father. And because of that, he says, I delight to do thy will. Do you delight to do the will of God? Do you know what the will of God is? Let me ask you this. Have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation? Because that's the will of God. He wants you to believe in the completed work of what his son has accomplished on the cross and in the tomb and the resurrection. And once you do that, you will please him uh, with such delight that he'll gladly save your soul. Now, to delight someone is to affect with great pleasure. And if it's your idea to affect great pleasure upon the Heavenly Father, then you will ac accomplish this by conforming to his word. So it's very important that we know what the Bible says. We cannot go with our vain imaginations when it comes to this idea of getting the things that we desire. Us, for us to obtain the desires of our heart, we're going to have to delight ourselves in God, who gave us the word and who made us. The Bible tells us how to do this, but be forewarned about this thing, because it may require changes in your life and in your mind and in your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord with loving kindness. That was the first thing the Lord said he exercises in the earth. How wonderful are the loving kindnesses of God to us. Listen to some of these things. Psalm 51, verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. God wants to blot out all your transgressions, all your sins. But he cannot do that without faith to please him. And that faith that pleases him is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. In his great redemption, Psalm 103, verse 4 says, Who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. So we see that the Lord's loving kindness will redeem us from destruction, from the eternal lake of fire. God wants us to deliver, be delivered from hell. He wants to remove our sins from us, and he shows his loving kindness to us through the death and resurrection of his son. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world. That's loving kindness, my friend, to a people that do not deserve it. And his great desires for us. Psalm 143, verse 8. 
Cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning, for in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk, for I lift up my soul unto thee. Is it your concern uh, how that God would direct your steps every day? To lead you in the paths of righteousness? Is this a desire of your heart? If it is, then he will show his loving kindness to you and direct your path. And then his precious promises in Hosea chapter 2 verse 19, where it is written, And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. Now remember, you who are saved, uh, the upcoming marriage supper of the Lamb, where he's going to uh, pour out his grace and mercy once again as we enjoy that great reunion with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. King David, King David, overwhelmed by the great magnitude of God's words of love, cried out, What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? He says, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. Psalms 116, verses 12, 13, and 17. Can anything less be expected of us in return of such love to someone who's been so gracious to us? My friends, in truth, not one of us is worth the price Jesus Christ paid for our redemption and our salvation. He bore our own humiliations. He bore our griefs. He bore our shame and our sins in his body when he hung on that cross. Yet God's word says in Isaiah 53, verse 10, It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. God put a very high value on the soul of a man. He said in Mark chapter 8, verse 36, What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And then he pays for our sins with his own suffering and his own shed blood on that cross. We can praise God for his great compassion toward us in dying in our place. It is wickedness enough when the enemies of God openly display their hatred toward him. How much sore the grieving of God's Holy Spirit when his own children callously rebel against him. These things ought not so to be. Ephesians 5, chapter 3 says, Fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Would you expect even your earthly father to be pleased with such behavior? How much less your pure, holy, heavenly father to take pleasure in it? Thankfully, this does not have to be uh, uh, mis our, our own miserable case. For we have the capability to bring much delight and gladness into the eyes of our God and the Heavenly Father. We do this by obeying His Word. We do this by delighting ourselves in the Word of God. Psalm 94. Read Psalm 119. The entire uh, book of, uh, the entire chapter of Psalm 119. Oh, the, the, the writer of the psalm and his desire to uh, believe the Word of God and do the Word of God. And then delighting uh, ourselves in Israel. That's another thing. Toward God's chosen people. Genesis chapter 12. Uh, it tells us that he will bless the nations which bless Israel. Now, toward your brethren in Christ. How are things going between you and the brethren? Is there sorrow? Is there... Uh, Envy? Is there strife? What's going on with that? The Bible tells us to be kind one to another. And these are for believers. Imagine having to give believers these instructions. Uh, and be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Now why would the apostle have to put that down in writing if it weren't happening? And then toward your neighbors. If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. So think about these things. If you want the desire of God's heart, you have to practice and exercise loving kindness. And that's a, a little bit of what loving kindness covers. 
and then towards the outcasts of society, and those towards your enemies, towards your wife or husband and your children. Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in the Lord for in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. So it's important for us to understand what pleases God. And one thing that does is loving kindness. And you as a believer, if you can develop loving kindness, make that a priority in your life, you'll be pleasing God so much that he will give you the godly desires of your heart. Secondly, you can delight yourself in the Lord with judgment. Now, God is a God of judgment. He always judges righteous judgment. He's not a man that he should lie. All of his judgments are equitable, and they're just. He renders unto every man according to his deeds. The righteous statutes and commandments of God are called his judgments. Here's some here. Psalm 19, verse 9. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Psalm 119 again, verse 137. Righteous art thou, O Lord, and upright are thy judgments. And then verse 160. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. So God's judgments are righteous. David proclaimed from the very core of his heart that the judgments of God are righteous altogether. The Proverbs of King Solomon have a specific purpose for being included in God's Word. Listen to these. They benefit God's people in this way. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. To give subtlety to the simple. To the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand the proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. Proverbs 28.5 tells us that evil men understand not judgment, but they that seek the Lord understand all things. We who have been wonderfully saved by the grace of a holy God can delight in the Lord with judgment by doing these things, believing that the judgments of God are correct at all times. Our Heavenly Father is always pleased when His children, children are in agreement with Him. So again, Psalm 119, verse 75, I know, O Lord, that Thy judgments are right, and that Thou in faithfulness hath afflicted me. Psalm 119, verse 20, My soul breaketh for the longing that it hath unto thy judgments at all times. So, believing God's judgments are right all the time, when it talks about you or when it talks about Him. Secondly, by basing all of our judgments according to God's Word, and not going about with our own opinions about things, but being established and firm foundation of the Word of God. Basically, men do not think like God thinks. Their ways are not like His ways, according to Isaiah 55, verse 8. In general terms, men are self-seeking individuals. They're self-centered, they're man-fearing, with thoughts of, what's in it for me? Well, happy is the man who has a judge in a court of law, who is God-seeking, God-centered, and God-fearing, with thoughts of, how can I glorify God in all of this? Thirdly, by judging righteous judgment. It's, it's terrible when you don't do it righteously, when you don't consider all the things that are involved with a, a particular thing. Proverbs 31.9 says, Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. The Lord Jesus gave explicit instructions with a warning against prejudicial judgments. Prejudice is judging before all the facts are in. Pre-judging. Not becoming a hypocrite in your judgments is important as well. Well, how much easier and accurate judgment would be if we, like God, were able to look upon the other person's heart? Because God looks upon the heart. Judge ourselves before judging others is another principle. Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, 
first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. It was the Lord Jesus Christ who spoke those words in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. And Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, 31 and 32, For if we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. So here's the second principle, is that we need to exercise judgment. Proper judgment according to the word of God. This will help us get the desires of our heart, because this is what God delights in. Loving kindness, judgment, and finally, righteousness. Delight yourself in the Lord with righteousness. Righteousness, as used in the scriptures and theology, uh, in which it is chiefly used, is nearly equivalent to holiness. Comprehending the holy principles and affections of the heart and conforming of a life to God's word. It includes all we call justice, honesty, and virtue with holy affections. In short, it is true religion. In fact, James, in chapter 1, verse 27, says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Now the Holy Bible says that the whole world lieth in wickedness. It's just a bed of sin, a, a, a cesspool of filth and d disgusting sins that God uh, says, listen, the whole world is corrupt, but I've sent my son to redeem mankind. Put your faith and trust in him. Now unspotted from the world means separation from the filthiness which is in it, so that it isn't on you or it isn't in you, like in your heart. Are you living to please the Lord? Listen, I'm not telling you to compare yourself to your neighbor or your family member. I'm asking if you are living to please the Lord. How would you know if you were? Just because you're not running around getting into trouble doesn't mean you're living your life to delight the Lord. Understand that there are some requirements and some things that God is expecting of you to do. And if you're not doing those things to please the Lord, then you can't expect to get the desire of your heart. As I said, the formula is very simple. The principles are very plain. But to follow through on these things to really get your desires, well, it takes some doing on your part. God is ready and willing on his part. Now listen, if you're a child of God, if you've been born again by the Spirit of God and adopted into God's family through the new birth, and that comes through faith in what Jesus did for you, how much more so should we be careful to keep ourselves unspotted from the filth of this old world, since we have been clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and we're patiently waiting for the hour of that special occasion, the return of the blessed Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to, for His church? and the marriage supper of the Lamb. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. We should be very thankful to have a patient Heavenly Father who has provided a method for daily cleansing of His precious children. You'll find that in 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 and 9. But if we walk in the light, that's the light according to the Word of God, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, simply in speaking, folks, we do not confess our sins to other men. We confess our faults to men, and we have plenty of faults. But our sins we can only confess to God, for only God can forgive sins. So please, take that advice and live right and keep your sins to yourself. Just confess them to the Lord. Otherwise, somebody might take advantage of you. Now, being thankful for these things is important. We need to walk in the light of God's Word and understand what the Bible has to say. It's very simple to read. It's uh, not that difficult to understand, but to grasp every last jot and a tittle of it is, is not an easy task, and I have to say that I, know, uh, I fall short of that. I don't know all the different things, but I know what God wants to do as far as saving a soul goes. Confess and forsake our sins to Him so He can forgive them. A good father loves when his children lovingly obey Him. God the Father is no different. In fact, uh, good fathers 
get that trait, that characteristic from God himself. So are you living to please the Lord? You could do this by living a, a holy and a righteous life. Not a smug, arrogant uh, atmosphere, attitude, walking around. Oh, I'm better than everyone else. There was an individual who was just like that. The, the publican and the Pharisee. And the Pharisee said the... Uh, he stood and prayed with himself. He didn't pray to God. He prayed to, uh, with himself. He said, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican over here. And so we understand the publican just smote his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said that that publican, in his humility, was made righteous and forgiven. But the proud Pharisee, he, had, he received no forgiveness. So, the publican was righteous in God's eyes. Now listen, it's important for you to know that there is no other thing that God takes delight in greater than that you put your faith and trust in what His Son accomplished for you. His death, His burial, and His resurrection. I tell you today, I urge you, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Remember, the delight is not knowing what pleases God, it is the doing of it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ today. Thank you, and God bless. Amazing grace.